Okay, today we're talking about trends in the periodic table. Uh, the great usefulness of the periodic table lies in being able to predict various trends in the chemical properties of the elements. So the position of the elements in the periodic table provides an important clue about uh, its chemical and physical properties. And to give you an example, I, I wrote down the uh, melting points and the boiling points of the alkaline of the alkaline metals. I chose lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium. And you'll see that as the metal, as the atomic number of the metal increases, as the metal gets bigger, its boiling point decreases. I recorded it in Kelvin. So lithium has a melting, uh, a boiling point of 1,600, and cesium was way down here at 944. Likewise, the melting points, the smallest metal, lithium, has 454 Kelvin as a melting point, whereas cesium melts at uh, room temperature, 301 Kelvin. There are four properties in the periodic table or trends that we should be aware of because they have uh, they possess the important predictive power for the chemical reactivity of the elements. They are ionization energies, electron affinity, atomic radius, and electronegativity. If you know a little bit about these properties of the element, you could make pretty good predictions about the reactivity of the element under certain conditions. For example, with uh, the most electronegative element, which is fluorine, uh, it's possible to predict that it'll have electron withdrawing uh, power, so it, it'll tend to pull the electrons towards itself in a, uh, in a molecule. And if we look at the second word, we'll see the different, the different definitions of what those uh, things mean. first one is the ionization energy, and it is the energy input required to remove a valence electron from a mole of gaseous atoms. So if you have a mole of gaseous lithium, the amount of energy input required to turn it into lithium ions, a mole of lithium ions, is 520 kilojoules per mole. By the way, the conventions for this are that if you have a positive sign in front of it, it means you've had to pump energy into it. It's an endothermic reaction. On the other hand, if something has a negative sign in front of it, it means that it, it's uh, an exothermic reaction, meaning it's giving off energy. Unfortunately, uh, engineering students tend to have opposite sign conventions, so that can lead to, to some confusion. So if you do have any questions about thermochemistry, uh, don't ask an engineering student because they're going to have the opposite conventions. It's going to be confusing. At any rate, uh, the trend in ionization energies generally increases from left to right and from bottom to top. Uh, so the, the biggest elements, the biggest metals, first of all, metals tend to lose electrons. They're the ones that uh, require the least energy expenditure to ionize. They give up electrons easily. But in addition to that, the bigger the metal, the more easily it loses one of its valence electrons because its grip on that last shell of electrons on the outside of the atom tends to be weaker compared to the smaller atom. So ionization energies tend to increase as the atom gets smaller and also as it tends more to becoming a non-metal. So the fluorine will be very hard to ionize. It's hard to remove an electron from fluorine because fluorine hangs with its electrons. On the other hand, francium, which is at the bottom left of the, of the periodic table, you'd be able to predict, would very easily lose an electron. The next property we want to look at is electron affinity. And that, by definition, is the energy input required to add an electron to a mole of gaseous atoms. In the case of fluorine gas, a mole of fluorine gas, if you were to add an electron to it, you'd get fluoride um, ions, but you'll see that it's got a negative electron affinity, meaning that it would actually release energy to get ionized uh, fluorine gas, because fluorine, in fact, is a nonmetal and uh, acquires a noble gas configuration by gaining one electron. So there is, a, there is an energy release that associated with that. If, on the other hand, you try to take an electron away from lithium, uh, sorry, if you try to add an electron to lithium, you would have to put a lot of energy into it because lithium atoms uh, are metals. They don't like to take on extra electrons. They actually like to lose the electrons. The next property we're going to look at is atomic radius. Now, atomic radii tend to decrease as you go from left to right. I'll put back the periodic table so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. So 
atomic radii tend to decrease from left to right, and they, and they tend to increase from top to bottom. Obviously, as you get more and more electrons, as the atomic number increases, the number of electrons in the neutral atom will also increase proportionally. So there's 87 electrons in the francium atom, there's only three electrons in the, in the neutral lithium atom. So those atoms tend to get bigger as you go down, but they tend to get smaller, paradoxically, as you go from left to right. And the nonmetals um, are tend to be the smallest atoms in the periodic table. The third, uh, the fourth property, perhaps the most important one, is electronegativity. It's a measure of an atom's attraction for electrons within a covalent bond. Electronegativity increases from bottom to top and from left to right. So the most electronegative element is fluorine. And one uh, good mnemonic you can use is for our new piece of Auburn, British cavalry here. May not be very appealing to our British friends, but it's not meant to, to be offensive. Uh, you could also memorize it this way, von Holberg Huff metals. It's just a mnemonic that lists the most electronegative elements, the least electronegative element. Electronegativity is one of those concepts that has a very powerful uh, predictive power. It helps you understand organic chemistry. It helps you to understand the strange behavior of water. Uh, well, you might not think that water has strange behavior. It, in fact, does because uh, if you think about it, water is made of two elements that boil at sub-zero temperatures. Hydrogen boils at minus 260. Oxygen boils at minus 186 degrees Celsius. So how is it that water, which is composed of these two elements, hydrogen and oxygen, boils at a temperature of plus 100? What is it about the combination of these two elements that gives them the property of having a much higher boiling point and melting point than you would think? Well, if you take a look at the structure of water, you'll see that, first of all, it's composed of an oxygen atom, which is pretty high on the electronegativity scale. It's the second most electronegative element. And then there's hydrogen, which is much lower on the electronegativity scale compared to oxygen. So in a water molecule, there's a slight negative charge on the oxygen, symbolized by a delta minus. And it tends to be a slightly positive charge on the hydrogen, symbolized by a delta H plus. And this slight charge imbalance caused by the large difference in electronegativities creates a polar covalent bond. And water molecules have a tendency, to, a tendency to line up because of these polar bonds so that they form bonds with each other. So if you see two water molecules close to each other in, in a water solution, the hydrogen atom of one water molecule will bind to the oxygen atom of another water molecule next to it, and likewise uh, on the same molecule on the other side of the bond. And that creates, that, it's a weak bond, but it creates enough co cohesive force that it raises the melting and boiling point of water way higher than you would expect it to be. In addition, it, it allows for properties like um, surface tension. That's why insects can walk on, on water. There are certain insects, like the water strider, that can walk on the surface of the water because of this effect of the, of the hydrogen bonding in water molecules. Water molecules also make very good solvents uh, for ionic compounds. And many other such s substances that have charges. So the understanding of electronegativity helps to understand a lot of other concepts that arise in chemistry. Leave it up there.